chapter 25, America moves to the city. <clears throat> so we just got done talking about America moving to the country, to the rural area, but there was this movement that went back and forth. Not everybody was moving out to the country. There were many people that were moving to the country, not liking it and coming back. There were immigrants that were coming into the city. So the numbers are swelling in the city, in the cities as well. <clears throat> So people were drawn to the city for a number of different reasons. Some of them are here. Electric cars, being able to hop on a trolley to go to work. High rises, electricity, right? As opposed to, uh, you know, candlelight out in the country, there wasn't electricity there, but the cities there is. Indoor plumbing, no more outhouses. The, the ability to be able to shop at places like Sears, Montgomery Wards, and even Macy's. And then of course, probably the biggest reason why people were drawn to the city is the last one right there, jobs. Um, some of them that were, you know, moved west, couldn't make it, came back looking for jobs. Immigrants coming into the city looking for jobs. Here's a, a picture of a couple of skyscrapers um, in Chicago. Chicago is well known for its architecture, even today. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do when I was in Chicago was to just go around and look at the amazing buildings. And this is where the skyscraper was started. You know, now that steel is readily available with uh, through the Bessemer process and it's affordable and, uh, you know, it's, it's there's large there's large amounts coming out of places like Pennsylvania. It made the ability to be able to build these high rises that much easier with the steel skeleton structure. Um, with a wood, if it was just wood, you could only go up a few floors, but uh, with the steel skeleton structure, the sky was the limit. And that's where they got the word skyscraper from. Also allowed for the building of bridges to bridge communities. Uh, the most well-known and first uh, suspension bridge in the United States was the Brooklyn Bridge built uh, in 1883 and it connected the new york boroughs of manhattan and brooklyn together still a uh, still standing um, amazing structure in new york uh, it was the first steel suspension bridge in the united states it was built at a cost of 16 million dollars and 26 lives um, it was very dangerous work building these bridges um, people died from falls but um, more than anything they as they uh, where they were underwater uh, building the base of the structure, the foundation, and uh, they would get uh, nitrogen in their blood and they die of the bends. Um, yeah, they would use these things called caissons. Um, if you look at the two structures on the side here, um, they, it, in order to be, for these suspension bridges to be structurally sound, the pillars had to go down into the bedrock twice as deep as they went up, twice as deep. So you can imagine how deep this is. So not only this, but you're having to go down um, into the water, get to the bedrock, and then go down into the bedrock twice as much as is showing here. So that's that's quite, quite a lot of work. Now, if they were to go in the middle here, it would be even harder because it's, it's way deeper here in the middle than it is uh, near the shore. And that's why they suspend the bridge with these steel cables. Um, you could barely see these steel cables, uh, but they hold up this bridge. Now, would this be more structurally sound if they had a pillar right in the middle that went all the way down? Sure, but at what cost? Um, it would be much, a lot more money, um, a lot more ingenuity, technology, and of course, loss of lives too was uh, at this time when they literally sent people down in diving bells to dig into the bedrock. Pretty dangerous, dangerous work. And you couldn't stay down there very long because you would get that nitrogen in your blood and they had no way to cure you back then. So people uh, died large numbers doing this kind of work. So this is currently the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, this is the longest bridge here. It's in Japan, the longest suspension bridge. It's known as the Akashi Kaioki Kaiokyo Bridge. It's it spans 6,532 feet. And there you can see it. Now, the pillars are, 
you know, still not in the deep middle of this area right here, but they are in deep water. And now this is not done by men in diving bells anymore. It's done by pneumatic drills and whatnot. So um, makes these bridges uh, doable, much more doable. There's what a trolley car would look like back then in the 1800s. This is probably about 20 to 25 years before uh, motor vehicles are, were used. It's, a, it's something you would see in San Francisco currently. And they would have electricity going through the lines that would um, move the, the cars forward. With these movement to the cities, you're having all kinds of problems. You know, overcrowding is a huge problem in the cities where all these people are trying to live. Um, it created slums and, you know, tremendous amounts of crime and filth and stench and disease. A tenement house was, uh, you know, where they would jam as many people as they could into a structure and it caused, you know, disease because of how filthy they were oftentimes and they were, you know, rat infested. Uh, they were, you know, susceptible to burning. Um, fire was a big problem, killed a lot of people back then. <clears throat> and then all these cities were run by political machines that we've talked about. The Gilded Age was filled with these political machines all over in the big and medium sized cities. A guy would become a mayor, get elected over and over and over again. It doesn't always have to be mayor, but it could be some city position, an elected position, and then would pay the immigrants who uh, were able to vote and sometimes the ones that weren't able to vote because they didn't have the ability to be able to check up on that like they do today. And they would have them vote often and they'd pay them. Uh, they continue to pay them. And as long as they were in power, they continue to get their pay. And then every time that they needed to have someone go vote for them, these immigrants would go vote for them often. And then once these machines started, you couldn't get rid of them. Here's some pictures uh, during this time pretty sad picture here with kids that couldn't be more than four or five years old, homeless, sitting around a grate in New York for warmth there, the steam coming out of the uh, underground, keeping them warm. <clears throat> this was, was an award-winning design um, of what today we might call them projects. Uh, you saw these in places like New York and Chicago and the award-winning design was a dumbbell, they were called dumbbell tenement houses. If you look at those, like if you're looking at them from the sky, they uh, appear to be two dumbbells on a rack right there with the handles right here. Um, you know, they're very small. I mean, think about this, 11 by 14 feet. That's, that's like a, a closet. The, the, this one, nine by six, this room, six by nine. I mean, you know, and they're jamming tons of people in there. Um, you know, the bathroom would be shared facilities by a lot of different families and um, these dumbbell tenement houses would be lined up one after the other and uh, it would dominate a community and they'd have one dumbbell t tenement house and another one and they're all uh, just in a row. The kids would that uh, lived in these dumbbell tenement houses would rarely ever see the sun only when it was straight above their heads because they, they would never get out of the projects, so to speak. Um, they have the schools within these projects. That's why in places like New York, they number their schools. They have so many schools in there. It's PS, Public School 101 or something. Um, the kids would, would you know, just stay in those areas. And that's where the Boys and Girls Clubs of America came into play in the late 1800s, where they would take kids out of the inner city and take them out to the country in places like New York. Okay, so big topic in AP is immigration. And they break up immigration into two different um, time periods. It's really three different time periods, but we're gonna talk about the two here first. Uh, the first is old immigration. And old immigration was up to 1880. Up to 1880. So uh, any time that you know, it goes all the way back to, I don't know, I guess you could say 1607 when the immigrants first came over and settled Jamestown, all immigration up to 1880. Most of the immigrants that came over were from Great Britain, from the British Isles, really, whether it's Ireland, Great Britain uh, and Western European countries. So, um, you know, like Spain, um, like France. So British Isles and Western European countries, that's where they mainly came from. They were white, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. 
They usually came from democratic countries. And by the time that we're talking about now in the 1880s, they are educated and they usually found the decent jobs. The new groups that are coming in that were the time period for new immigration is 1880 to 1930. And they came from Southern and Eastern European countries like Italy, Greece, Poland, Russia, um, those, those countries, the Baltic countries. These countries had little democratic history. Mostly they were poor. They came from poor areas. They were looking for an opportunity. Um, the people who came over here preferred the cities because that's where the jobs were. Most of them were illiterate, couldn't speak the language and accepted low paying jobs and they got accused of driving down wages. The same as when the Chinese and the Japanese came over, the same as when the Irish came over during the potato famine. It seems like all new immigrants are, who are coming looking for opportunity are accused of driving down wages. These new immigrants tended to live exclusively on their own in their own communities. If you've ever been to San Francisco, there's a little Italy section. Same thing with New York. Um, Italians that came over tended to stick together. They lived in, in groups um, and they spoke their own language. And it was like Italy West or Greece West. Um, you had German towns, China towns, little Italy's, all these uh, areas cropped up in the cities. The melting pot, when they talk about America being a melting pot, that isn't necessarily accurate at this time, not yet. Uh, the melting pot though was the schools. So when someone would go to say PS 101, kids would be coming from all over. You'd have English kids, French kids, Italian kids, Greeks, Poles, Russians, and they all kind of came together. That's where the melting pots are actually happening. Once the kids go home, they're speaking their native language, um, they're, they're living in little Italy's or, you know, uh, different sections of town where they would just exist with their own. So it's kind of unique. The melting pot stuff comes a little bit later. This is, I, I always really like this picture right here. Looks like something straight out of the Godfather. This is in New York and this is the little Italy section of New York. I imagine my grandparents were on this street, um, probably, you know, not quite this time, but maybe in the 1920s, they would have been uh, spending time in this area because they came from Italy and they ended up here uh, in New York and uh, lived there for a while before they came out west to Monterey. Uh, so yeah, this is a colorized picture um, and this is what a little Italy would look like. And most of the most, if not everyone in that picture was Italian because that's who, who stayed. It was not common to see people that weren't Italian venture into um, these communities. Talked about political machines. Boss Tweed was the most well-known boss of all in New York. He controlled everything there. Now let's talk about a reformer by the name of Jane Adams. Jane Adams um, was someone who was uh, very literate, very smart, um, had suffered from a lot of different diseases when she was young and was always in and out of hospitals and, you know, but she still maintained her studies. Uh, when, when she graduated from high school, she decided she was going to go to Europe and, and just, you know, see what, what was going on in Europe and, and uh, just observe life somewhere else. She was very curious. What she found in Europe was uh, unique. She had never seen anything like it in Chicago. And what she saw was young, educated people working with the youth in the slums. Um, in England, there were, there were a lot of slums there because the Industrial Revolution had been going on for such a long time. And she observed this and she, was, she uh, said, wow, when I go back to America, I'm gonna try to do the same thing. And she was driven and she convinced a man by the name of Hull, last name was Hull, to donate a building in, in uh, Chicago, in the uh, south side of Chicago, uh, that that would be used for just this purpose and it would be in the middle of like what, what I've been calling the projects so the dumbbell tenement houses and it was just a neat orderly place for kids to go think of it as preschool kindergarten daycare all wrapped in one um, at a very very low price if not most of the time free um, they could drop off 
get parents could drop off their kids there. Uh, if they got out of school, this was a place that they could go. There were games, there were books, um, there were activities going on all the time. And uh, once again, this was a building that was donated by somebody. And uh, Jane Adams was the one who started this whole thing. So I think it's the forerunner to like the Boys and Girls Club. Think of it as that. I had the opportunity to go there and see it when I was in Chicago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I took some, some pictures and, and these are some of the things that were on the wall. It says here on the bottom, the settlement house has provided spaces and opportunities for college educated people to research, work and improve urban conditions. These men and women settled in poor urban areas in order to share, receive and create knowledge and culture within their neighborhoods, neighbors as interdependent communities. So kids coming in and uh, working with them. Shameless self-promotion here. Here is me at uh, the whole house in Chicago. It's on the campus, right off, right off the campus of um, Chicago University, a, a, a university that was actually started by um, Rockefeller, donations from Rockefeller. So this picture here, see this picture here? I'm standing right in this area right here where I have my cursor and this, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this nativism that rears its ugly head again. Um, we talked about the Know Nothing Party earlier in the year. And the Know Nothing Party was a reaction against uh, Irish mainly coming into the United States. And, you know, they were Catholic and they didn't like them being Catholic. Most of the people here were Protestant. Um, and they didn't like the fact that the Irish were driving down wages. You are going to get the same pushback during new immigration because of all the Italians and all the Greeks and all the Russians that are coming in. Um, there's a lot of people that don't like them. So it's, it's coming up again, um, the fact that they're driving down wages and they're bringing their communistic or socialistic idealisms here to the United States, especially ones that are coming from Russia. Uh, in 1917, there was enacted a literacy test temporarily that made for, uh, they, that made for a law that said that you couldn't enter the United States unless you could speak English and read. So uh, read English, speak English, and you had to be able to write it. It was a literacy test. Eventually it was deemed unconstitutional, but it was on the books for a little while. Woodrow Wilson, president at the time, signed it into law. And then uh, it was uh, overturned later on by the Supreme Court. There were quotas that were set up we'll be talking about later on quotas that would limit the number of immigrants from any specific countries to once that hit that quota during the year, then they would shut off immigration until the next year. So they would limit the number of people, kind of a filtering of who came into the United States. The Chinese Exclusion Act was on the books for over four years when Chinese were forbidden from coming into the United States. And then the Gentlemen's Agreement limited the number of Japanese that were coming into the United States. That was signed in 1907. Again, I'll, we'll get into more detail on that um, soon. Take a look at this political cartoon. Um, you've got an immigrant coming off a gangplank, coming off a ship. He's, he's uh, uh, you know, obviously a poor based on what he's carrying. He's about to get on the, uh, off the ship, get on the deck, on the uh, wharf here. And you see in front of him, some men that are well-dressed, rich, and they're saying, whoa, stop, get back on that ship. You're not welcome here. In the background are their own shadows and possibly their ancestors. I, I think it's more their ancestors than their own, but it might be their parents or their grandparents. It's their shadow that at one point they were this guy walking off the gangplank coming to America because at some point we're all immigrants to this country. All right, so they're forgetting their past and they're, you know, putting roadblocks up for immigrants to come in when in fact they at one point, their families were immigrants. So you see, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act here, an ad um, and says here, it's high time we introduce immigrant quotas, Native Americans, what if they would have introduced immigrant quotas, which obviously they did not. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit, talk about the Statue of Liberty, which was presented to the United States as a gift um, from France on July 4th, 1884. 
it was a, a sign of our friendship and our alliance with the French. Uh, the idea of liberty shared by both people. The statue was shipped to the United States. It was dedicated on October 28th, 1886. Obviously, it was shipped in pieces and then it was uh, put together back together again when all the pieces arrived. She wears a crown of seven spikes that stand for light of liberty on the seven seas and seven continents. The Statue of Liberty is located on Liberty Island at the entrance to New York Harbor in Upper New York Bay. She sits atop the star-shaped Fort Hood and stands 151 feet high. And there is the Statue of Liberty. Here's a view of the Statue of Liberty, uh, kind of an eerie photo here as it's from the, trade, the World Trade Center that obviously were taken down on September 11, 2001 by the airplanes, uh, terrorism, terrorist attack on the United States. You can see, I put this in here so you can see where it is in relation to the Statue of Liberty. And here's the awful day that was September 11. And uh, <clears throat> here it is, obviously, before. And uh, here's where uh, Statue of Liberty is. If you know anything about Ellis Island, where immigrants were set to check in, here's Ellis Island right there. OK, so with the new immigrants, obviously, Catholicism got a big boost in the United States. Catholicism has been the number one religion in the United States since 1900. And uh, the fact that there were so many immigrants coming in from Catholic countries is during new immigration is the reason for that. There was, because of the religion, uh, religious differences in the United States, it created all kinds of, of uh, issues just like it does in 2021. Uh, Charles Darwin published On Origin of Species, which set forth the new doctrine of evolution. And uh, it pitted those who believed in uh, creationism, you know, that we, we uh, all evolved from Adam and Eve, the re, uh, fundamentalist religion, religious people versus the modernists who say, well, it's fact that, you know, evolution has happened. We evolved from a single cell, uh, single cell to uh, oxygen bubble to a uh, plant to an animal to an ape to a human right you had the the evolution that you probably talked about in your science classes those are, that's the modernist view and then the fundamentalists say no that didn't happen we, we evolved from adam and eve and then you have those that kind of merge the two also Education became incredibly important as people begin to realize that if you want to have a good, strong democracy, you must have educated people. So the idea of public schools, um, the idea of more Catholic schools, this whole Chautauqua movement uh, during this time, which was traveling schools, people would come around and give lectures. Um, I would equate it to uh, distance learning, <laughs> doing stuff like, like we're doing, although obviously they didn't have computers. So, yeah, education became big during the 1880s. Speaking of education, we're going to compare two uh, civil rights activists at a time when there weren't very many civil rights activists because of the post-reconstruction uh, situation in the South. Booker T. Washington versus W.E.B. Du Bois. Booker T. Washington was a former slave. He... Uh, was very educated, educated himself at first. Um, and he decided he was going to start a school in Alabama called Tuskegee University, still around today. The philosophy of Booker T. Washington was that we must educate African Americans in many different areas, not just book learning, but you had to teach African Americans different job skills like farming carpentry, brick making, shoe making, printing, and cabinetry. Why? Because the only skill that most of them had after the Civil War and after slavery ended with the 13th Amendment was in the cotton industry. So expanding African-American influ uh, their uh, influence by giving them more job skills so they could go out and get different jobs, better jobs. However, it was, becomes controversial because Booker T. Washington's philosophy was African Americans should be satisfied with being free from slavery 
and not challenge authorities yet until you become economically viable and then civil rights will come later. So you can see where this goes, right? You have those people like W.E.B. Du Bois who we're gonna talk about that said, absolutely not. African-Americans should demand and they deserve civil rights right now, not down the road, but right now. So it's gonna be, it's, it, to say he's con controversial is, is an understatement. However, look where Booker T. Washington is coming from. He came from slavery. W.E.B. Du Bois, on the other hand, was someone who uh, wasn't born into and never was a slave. It is in his past, family members, ancestors, but not him personally, whereas Booker T. Washington was in it at, at one point. He was a slave. One of Washington's most well-known students was George Washington Carver, who later discovered hundreds of uses for peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans. A book that Booker T. Washington wrote was called Up from Slavery, where he explained his situation. And here's a, a, a classroom at Tuskegee University and a picture of Booker T. Washington. Okay, I've been mentioning W.E.B. Du Bois. He's the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard. He was brilliant. He demanded complete equality for African-Americans. He wanted it right, wanted to have equal rights right now. He is one of the founders of the NAACP in 1910. And he took a, a, a whole chapter out of his book, The Souls of Black Folk. And he criticized Booker T. Washington and actually called him an Uncle Tom. I'll talk about in class what that means um, when he said that. Uh, but W.E.B. Du Bois was uh, very critical of, to say the least, of, of Washington, Booker T. Washington's views. Both of them, you know, one more thing is that both of them were very influential in their time. And they were civil rights leaders and, and pushed hard for and worked hard for civil rights for African Americans at a time when nothing was really being done. You know, I made the statement before that after Reconstruction ended in 1877, nothing really happened in the area of civil rights until Martin Luther King came around in the 1950s. Some inroads were made, however, by Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. So colleges and universities that started to emerge after the Civil War um, were uh, historically black colleges like uh, University of or Howard University, Atlanta University, Hampton Institute of Virginia, uh, Southern University. These these are still around today. You had in 1862 the Morrill Act was passed, which provided generous grants of public land to the states from the federal government. Uh, basically, it was free as long as they built um, colleges that had as its base agriculture. So um, Cal Poly. Sacramento State, I believe Fresno State was also land grant colleges. Land grant colleges were, were colleges started for uh, from land and money from the federal government and their purpose was agriculture. And then the other ones were privately donated. Uh, Cornell uh, started by a railroad magnet. Leland Stanford uh, dedicated uh, Stanford University to his son who passed away. University of Chicago, as I said earlier, founded by John, or funded by John D. Rockefeller. So yeah, universities are getting huge land grants. Johns Hopkins maintained the nation's high grade graduate school, still around today, still strong. Some of the universities we're talking about. Okay, the, the rest of the, the chapter really focuses on individuals and concepts in literature, in art, in science, people like Louis Pasteur, pasteurization, people like Joseph Lister, who's making inroads in fighting of infection, um, figuring out that what kills a lot of people is infection, and then, you know, creating things that could fight infection, like antibiotics and things like that. Press, you know, newspapers coming around with the invention of the linotype in 1885. Um, we'll talk later on about yellow journalism to try to sell newspapers, uh, people like uh, w William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, there's a lot of, of reform going on during this time, too. People are talking about different ways because there's so, so, ma so many haves and have nots and a way to fight poverty. Um, you know, I want you to be familiar with Henry George, who wrote 
progress and poverty, which took to solve to undertook to solve the associated poverty with progress. He came up with the idea of a graduated income tax, um, and and you know tax increasing people's taxes so they could redistribute the wealth. Another reformer at the time was Edward Bellamy, who wrote Looking Backwards. He criticized the social injustices of the day and pictured a utopian government that had nationalized big business to serve the public good, meaning that any profits that big business had would then be turned around and be put back into community and individuals. Uh, so both Edward Bellamy and Henry George are really pushing the concept of socialism and, and redistribu redistribution of the wealth. So there are two who fought for um, the common man. Famous authors during this time, Mark Twain, you'd be, probably be familiar with Huckleberry Finn, Adventures of Tom Sawyer, uh, Stephen Crane, uh, The Red Badge of Courage, Jack London, Call of the Wild. Most of us had to read that at some point during our academic careers. So yeah, the, these, a lot of different uh, concepts that go on the rest of the chapter. All right, so this concludes chapter 25.